Hi, time for a wrap up, as they say on Booktube, of what I've been reading in the last month or so throughout January and into early February. And I want to begin with a little adage um, before we sort of dive straight in. Sturgeon's Law, which you may be familiar with and you may not. Theodore Sturgeon, the golden age and after SF writer, generally regarded as the finest literary writer to come out of genre SF in the golden age. And Theodore Sturgeon, he said at one point, this is in the 50s, he called it Sturgeon's Revelation. It, it sort of become colloquially known as Sturgeon's Law, which is 90% of everything is crud. I think he used a more offensive term, but I like crud. It reminds me of the thing using the word crud in Fantastic Four when I was a kid in the comics. So, and his idea was if 90% of everything is crud, then 90% of SF is crud. But then again, 90% of any field is crud. If you've got a sort of discerning palette and you know, it's all subjective, but it, it is it is something that's worth thinking about. And Orwell said something similar about books in a review and essay, I think, you know, a good sort of 10 years before that. And, you know, that in any sort of given area, a lot of it won't be so good. So given my recent sort of burnout, which you'll see me having in Hay on Y, and I've been reading in a very scattershot way since sort of starting the channel. Um, I've been sort of buying too many nostalgia titles in my book halls. So I'm settling in for, I think, a few months of rereads and reading authors I'm already familiar with whose works I haven't got around to. I've got a big Thomas Dish thing going on at the moment, actually. And of catch-ups with other sort of critically acclaimed books, which I've neglected, which are yet to come under the Andrews microscope, so we shall see. But in the last month, I've read three rock and roll books, um, a non-fiction book about film, which I'm going to cover briefly, various short stories, and the seven books or so which I'll cover today. I'm going to do one mega big review, and that's a book which is a reread, and I hadn't read it for a very long time, and that's Robert Silverberg's Tower of Glass. Sure it is. Which is absolutely magnificent. This is a panther um, from 76. It was first published in Galaxy magazine in 1970, serialised. Also in that year, I think it was before this one, Silverberg published the serial of Downward to the Earth, another fantastic book of his, which is a favourite of mine as well. So we're going to look at this. So this is my first ever Silverberg. And at the time, I felt it was good, but not exceptional. But I was comparing it with my current obsession that I'd had for several years then with Philip K. Dick, and particularly with this book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? This is the um, Golanx 50 version. It's not the arc of a first boy, would I like one? And really, I was sort of so enthralled to that book with the concept of the android that it sort of coloured my view of this book. I was a young reader. When I first read Androids by Dick, I was about 13. And when I read this, I was about, let's see, 17. I don't know, I was 18. I was still pretty young. And I was very much enthralled to Dick because he was the first American genre SF writer I read who I felt had real literary quality. I mean, I would have people like Heinlein and Herbert and Asimov, but Dick really blew things out of the water for me. And I was obsessed with androids and I've read it loads of times. And at that point in my life, I was rereading it at least once a year, maybe twice a year. So when I read this, and this was my first Silverberg, and I was put onto it by a friend of mine, I was less impressed. So the thing with Androids is that it's very, it's very serious. You're struck straight away by the seriousness of the book. It's adult nature. You know, it's 24 hours in the life of a working stiff in a fractious marriage, in a dangerous job, which he hates. And of course the marriage is dropped from you know the film which is a shame because Deckard's relationship with Iran is one of the most interesting things in androids a book full of interesting things and he's in this dangerous job which he hates it's in a dystopian future and <clears throat> really Deckard is seeking both status and spiritual redemption to gain solace in this sort of terrible world so Dick is domestic he's up close and personal you're zoomed in on the characters, you're very close to them, there's a lot of interaction, what have you. And this incredible realism in the book, the inventiveness, the Penfield mood organ was based on real research into electrical brain stimulation, the Voigtkampf empathy test, Mercerism, the religion, which is not mentioned in the film. There's a tiny reference via the owl. You know, one thing is certain, the only thing that's really certain into Android's dream of electric sheep is that the machine, the android, cannot be trusted. 
Tower of Glass, though, is a different sort of kettle of fish. I compare the two too much, as I say, and, you know, as both are about Android, so there you go. So Tower of Glass came out in 1970, and To Android's Dream was published in 1968 as a book. The main difference is that Tower of Glass is clearly more of a fabulation, it's a fable. You're more distance from the characters and the narrative in this than you are in the Dick novel. And it clearly has distinct religious references to the Old Testament. Um, the Tower of Babel, which we'll come on to that. Whereas Dick's book is more sort of humanist, referring to Christ sucker for the downtrodden, whether they be men, toads or donkeys. You know, in Mercerism, important animals are the ones which are downtrodden. And perhaps even a bit of Heidegger in the Dick book. Heidegger's concept of care towards the world. So there's a little bit of quasi-Christian ex existentialism in there as well. And of course, Dick was a Christian. So those things are very important in androids. Tower is set 200 years from now, I think it's 2218, and in the background of the book, poverty has been long eliminated because of a period of wars, of natural catastrophe, environmental collapse, and because of the advance of technology, automation, and what have you. And it's left a small population of human beings on Earth. There's no working classes, so they're all in a leisure class. There's comparative levels within that, but there's no real working class because they are androids who are our servants and slaves. And they're not really treated really badly. Um, they are more servants than slaves. They're kind of remunerated in their own way. They have their own homes and what have you. And this really allows Silverberg to focus on one of his sort of key perennial themes, which comes up very early in his work. You know, it starts in the early 60s. And this is the lives of the privileged and the materially successful, the wealthy. And he's just great at this. And I've said time and time again that the big Silverberg themes of power, transcendence, transformation and redemption. And privilege and success are a big part of this. And this is perhaps where the differences between Dick and Silverberg as human beings come through in their work. The personalities come out. You know, Dick was chaotic. He was insecure. He was brilliant, but erratic in his work. There are ups and downs. You do a great book and a terrible one and so on. And, you know, his success was mixed and it wasn't until late in his life that the critical acclaim, which came initially from Europe, from France and Britain, seeped over to the USA. And Dick was, you know, becoming regarded as a real luminary. And then, of course, he died very, very sadly. And, of course, what made him successful wasn't his own work. It was the film adaptation of Blade Runner. And we're going to come back to Blade Runner again in a moment. But Silverberg was different. You know, he was confident. He was assured, you know, from the beginning, he was very good in school. He was a high achiever educationally, financially and artistically. You know, he was a guy who managed to sort of make a real effort. He had talent. He developed it. And really his great strength to directly and depict sympathetically the lives of the wealthy and the powerful, instead of sort of immediately casting them as villains, you know, and displaying their confidence, but revealing their doubts and their flaws, is one of his great strengths as a writer. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because that's very different to Dick. In Dick, most powerful people aren't good. You know, in Silverberg, you know, they, they're fully rounded human beings. It's, you know, it's fantastic stuff. And for that alone, I would single him out as being a great novelist. So to talk a little about the plot of Tower of Glass, there's a message that's come from the stars and nobody understands it. It's a repeated numeric pattern of pulses and it continues for a while and it stops and it starts again with a different pattern. And there's one man who's obsessed with understanding what this message is and he wants to communicate with it. And that's a character called Simeon Krug or Krug. Um, I always thought of him as Krug, but maybe it's Krug. So I'm going to call him Krug because that's what I've always thought of him as. And um, he's kind of a business mogul and biologist and he's the creator of the androids in Tower of Glass. And he's, you know, he's a powerfully built man. He's a big guy. He's in late middle age. He's about 60, I think, but the same age as me. And he came from relative poverty and his parents were kind of burnouts. And he's an autodidact. He learned nothing in school. When he left, he had this urge. He's kind of a bit like Alan Sugar, one of the one of these classic self-made men that we hear about who usually have money in their background. But but Krug is different. He doesn't have money in his background. That's the thing. But he becomes a business mogul. He teaches himself genetics. He's an autodidact, as I say, and he plunges his hands into vats full of chemicals and he manages to make a synthetic kind of DNA and to form sort of genetic molds for androids. And he births these red skinned humanoid androids from these vats, the vat born, they call themselves. 
and they're kind of owned by humanity and they're not exactly slaves as I say and there are three classes three different types or subspecies depending on what you want to think of them because they are made of flesh and they, they this sort of way that he does this he homages Brave New World um, they're, they are called gammas, betas and deltas rather than the way the genetically engineered people of Brave New World are. The gammas are the majority. They're the sort of lumpen toilers of, um, of the world of Terroglass and the betas and middle grade functionaries. And then there's the alphas who are super capable administrators, organisers, high achievers. And interestingly, the way that their sort of class structure is is present and it replaces the real class structure of, of human beings in the book is that the gammas are sort of very common obviously there's lots of material labor physical tasks that need going the betas are less common they're like the sort of clerks and what have you and there's the alphas that there's only one alpha for every thousand gammas and you know they're super capable and this is one of the central characters there isn't any one central character it is kind of ensemble cast is called um thor and thor thor watchman and thor is really um simeon krug's sort of right hand man on the project they're working on he's depicted really amazingly well like a human being but not like one at the same time it's very clever and deft so krug is using his business empire which is vast and global and the android workforce that he owns to build a contemporary tower of babel to speak to the stars and the parallels are many and obvious and as soon as you notice this as soon as you think this is like the tower of babel because the people who build the tower of babel in the bible obviously want to speak to god and the aliens are sort of unknowable and their message is uncertain then you know <laughs> you sort of know really that the tower of glass is going to come crumbling down and it's obviously a symbol for hubris for pride for wanting to know and aiming to know more than we can. So it goes right back to the sort of gothic heart of SF, back to Frankenstein, you know, and, and before that, back to the fantastic sources of all story of mythology and religion. So it's very profound that way. And it, so it's got something really classical and ancient about it, as well as being very sort of modern as well, which is which is really strong. And um, the Tower of Glass is going to be the tallest structure on earth. And it's built in the Canadian tundra and this permafrost and it's built there because the signaling method that's going to be sent there's going to be a signal sent from the tower of glass from this tech this technological tower is better where the air is clearer and what have you it's rather like now where you know you can't see stars half the time when i was in hay recently because it's rural you can see the stars i haven't seen the stars so for years and years and years so you've got that going on and it's sent the tundra also because there's an interesting technical SF thing about this. They're going to use tachyon beams. Now, a tachyon is a theoretical particle which can travel faster than light because obviously a message from the stars is taking a long time to get there. And Simeon Krug is Krug, whatever I want to call him. He is impatient. He's an impatient man. He's used to sort of snapping his fingers and having everything done. And his time is running out. He's getting older. But having said that, in this world, people live much longer. So theoretically, it's a long time to live. But he's very impatient and he has an urge to know. And basically, they'll fire these tachyon beam signals, the messengers. And what the scientists have worked out is that the alien messages are coming from a super hot galactic cluster, an environment where it would be really hard to imagine anything evolving into sentience or even evolving at all. So that's a really tough one. So that's another question that's in the book. And one of the technical challenges very much for the scientists and the androids who are working on it, because the androids are scientists as well, they the alphas understand science. They really have to sort of build this tower and yet keep the permafrost intact and yet the tachyon beams and the energy that's required to create the tachyons and send them to the stars is immense. So, you know, if the permafrost defrost, the tower will come down. So there's cooling and all sorts of stuff. So the scientific side is really interesting. It's never dull. Um, if you like hard science, you'll enjoy that. But it's really well thought out. And that's the thing. The scientific world building in this is fantastic. And it's stronger than a lot of Silverberg's books. And there's more attention to detail. And he's obviously made a lot of it up. But it doesn't matter because it works so well. So that's absolutely brilliant. And I really enjoyed that aspect. And I've forgotten a lot about that. So... Krug sort of seeks immortality and apotheosis and his need to understand the message. And also, he's a man who's not satisfied. He's not self-realized. Despite the success, he still feels, you can tell, like a failure. He seeks self-realization by saying, I'm here. And there are moments where he's just saying to himself, he's repeating his name inwardly, 
Krug, Krug, Krug. You know, it's I am here. It's like the word of God in he the Hebrew mythos, the logos of God, I am. You know, it's the, th it's the thing that God first says. And, you know, Silverberg, of course, is Jewish. So that's interesting. So that's obviously in his background. In the background of any of us who grew up in Judeo Christian mythology and um, read the Bible at a young age. So that's all interesting stuff. So Krug is unfulfilled, but he's made indifferent and brusque by his power he's not a bad man but he is a brusque one he sort of he, he doesn't notice a lot of the time when people are suffering or what have you around him and it's not because he's willful or evil it's just this success has given him this distance and you know he is he's sympathetically unsympathetic which is what i liked he's really fully rounded and he hasn't noticed that beneath his nose the androids have founded a religion where he, Krug, is worshipped as a god. And this is bizarre because um, Thor Watchman, who works closely with Krug, you know, he, he, Krug is his god, and yet at the same time, he works for him, and Krug is his boss. So it's really interesting. So there's a comment about work there and power, which is, which is one that's just sort of come to me, and yet it's really obvious. So it is about work as well. I love books about work. I think work's a very interesting topic for novelists, and there's not enough science fiction novels about work and the rea economic reality that comes a lot in pkd as well actually which is very important and in Silverberg. so it is there so thor watchman is working for craig on this project the tower of glass and a little interesting aside just something that the alphas can do is they can jack in to the computers of the world they can jack into the tower which obviously is run by computers and they can merge their consciousness with it. So that's another early example of something which led to cyberpunk was Delaney had already done it as well. And that's an early sort of thing showing how the consciousness merging with the machine, but it's machine to machine. But of course they're a flesh machine. The androids are made of flesh, it's really interesting. So it is a man machine interface going on there. So Watchmen and the other androids, and there are, of course, you know, a huge number of them. There are more of them than there are people on the Earth of the Future in Tower of Glass. They sort of feel that um, Krug has a spirit which is different to his persona. And this is where we get into the sort of Holy Trinity type thing as well. He has a spirit within him that will liberate the androids once he becomes aware of them. And he will make the vat born equal to the womb born. There's also another type of person in the story who is bottle born, sort of, um, as we used to say, sort of test tube conceived. There's one character who's kind of test tube conceived. And really, the sort of, it's a religion with its own Bible, which is written, its own, its own testaments, which are written by the androids. And they've only written over a period of like 10 or 20 years. And it has its own chapels, they have secret churches. And what is the faith of the androids based on? And it's based on nothing. Krug barely notices them. He hasn't even considered them as human. To him, they're just things that he owns, that he's made. They're not human. It's like in Dick with Do Androids Dream, the whole question of, you know, what is real? The um, Nexus 6 is so similar to human being. You need an empathy test. So there's a question about empathy here in that, you know, who <laughs> doesn't feel any empathy of the androids they're just machines they're intelligent machines to him even though they're made of flesh he owns them so there's huge moral questions around that as well and it's obviously proud to slavery and that's even mentioned in the book it's, it's kind of obvious really um really the the book is like dicks in that it's asking the hum the sort of humanist ontological question what is real what makes a real human being are androids real so it's the same sort of thing so obviously silverberg must have read um, Do Androids, and obviously he was aware of Dick, they worked in the same milieu and what have you. So, and of course Silverman was, had also entered his key sort of phase by that point. He really was doing some, you know, magnificent work, and from about 67, 68 to 76, he's just, just powered forward. There's so many great novels, even the minor novels of the revisions are fantastic, so it's important stuff. So really, those sort of Dickian questions come up. So, it's a critique in lots of ways of the foolishness of faith without reason, perhaps. It's a parable of the religious versus the secular because you find yourself thinking, why do the androids think this? So it calls into question the very notion of faith without evidence. And that's an important thing for scientific narrative. 
um, and particularly for those of us who have atheistic bents or agnostic bents. You know, it is why do people believe this when there's no evidence? You know, we're so used to living in the material world. And we find that evidence, science, the scientific method, repeated experimentation that gets the same results actually works. And that's an important thing. So, and of course, some of the androids believe this as well. There's an android political party, which some of them are members of. The most of them are members of the secret church. And they form a political party with the aim of sort of gaining emancipation. And there are various references in the book that say in terms of the political situation, there's a party called the Witherers, which is saying that basically, you know, governments and politics is, is sort of dissolving in the face of corporations like Krugs. And this is this is because there's another sort of technological in, innovation in the book. There's transmats so and matter transmitters and the ubiquitous. And one of my favourite novels from a little bit later, I think, which sort of looks at this, and it's, it was a common trope in SF, had been for decades, is Barry and Malzberg's Guernica Night, which I'm going to talk about soon on the channel because I do love this. And this has sort of transmats. And people can basically step into these chambers and they get out of another one, another part of the world. So the meaning of geography and distance is eradicated and the androids use them too. The androids particularly like to live in, in Stockholm, in Sweden is one place where they live, interestingly enough. And there's some great sequences in Stockholm, actually. So that's all there. So there's all these questions about freedom and slavery and religion, faith versus science and what have you. The cast, as I say, is ensemble. Even though the interactions between Krug and Watchmen are quite important, there's other characters. There's Krug's son Manuel, who is going to be the heir to the empire. He has a young wife. Um, Krug, Manuel's father, wants him to sire, you know, grandchildren. And Manuel's rather feckless. And initially, you sort of think he's a bit of a waster. He spends his time going around the world having a good time. He's gr gradually and grudgingly taking on the responsibilities of his father's business empire. He believes privately that if his dad suddenly died, he would stop building the tower straight away. And he actually is having an affair with a female alpha android. Now, you cannot sort of, they can't get pregnant, but they can be, they can have sexual intercourse. So that's an interesting thing. They're just like people, except their skin is sort of like a light scarlet red. And Manuel has a relationship with this female alpha who, also has a relationship with Thor Watchman, which is different and it evolves. And you know, the character is just wonderfully, wonderful drawn, you know, and there's, there's um, an android called File Clark, who is really the head of the emancipation thing with the political party as well. And he's involved. There's all sorts of sort of political daring do and maneuvering and really finely sort of delineated and great marketry that sort of plotting where things slot together but yet at the same time there's chaotic moments there's other tech in there as well there's a thing called the shunt where people exchange consciousnesses with their friends and krug has never done this but manuel does it all the time so all this is in the melange it's wonderful stuff and in the background you've got this enigmatic message from the stars it truly is entrancing it's just such a wonderful book and the thing with it though the difference again as I say between Silverberg and Dick is the tone it's not up close and personal you are distance it's rather like the difference between say a Stanley Kubrick film and a David Cronenberg film in Cronenberg's film the films there are there is sometimes distance things like Cosmopolis if you look at something like The Brood which is a, it's really sort of a family saga looking at an internal drama um, in science fiction terms there is this thing where you're up close to characters and you feel the emotions and the angst. The Silverberg, there's a kind of classical detachment, which is rather like Kubrick. You're at a distance. It does mean the emotional impact isn't there because it is there. You look at Clockwork Orange, one of the reasons why Clockwork Orange is so powerful is that you see that you see the violence at a distance. It's not fast cutting and chaotic. You see the whole picture of it and it's horrible. And you see this in Silverberg. You see this great classical narrative that's presented to you and you sit back and it's more like watching a play of the more sort of classical variety than a kitchen sink drama. And that's that's the sort of sort of key difference. And you can objectify and relate to all the characters. Another part of the tone with Silverberg, of course, is that it's silvery, that it's measured, that it's 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 just so cold, but cold in a beautiful way. It's in a way where the style is smoothed out. There's no excesses in the prose. It's efficient. It's to the point. I mean, this is a book which is 205 pages long, you know, and there's, there's stuff in it, you know, sort of 
a lot of novelists would make a lot more of it. And today, this would be like 500 pages long, it'd be a total bore. But it's absolutely marvellous. It's fleet and sharp. So you do get this sort of standing back from things. And, and it does make you think about the issues. You know, often they're the same issues in, as in Android's Dream, but it makes you think about them differently. But it's a magnificent book. I would say in the canon, and I think my favourite Silverberg's, there's the big four, of course, um, which are the Book of Skulls, Dying Inside, A Time of Changes, and Downward to the Earth. I think in terms of traditional novelistic virtues, Dying Inside probably the best. The one I find the most interesting and that I go back to more often these days is the Book of Skulls, which I think is magnificent. Then Downward to the Earth is the underrated one of the four, and it's a great book whose stature will really grow. And then it's A Time of Changes, which is magnificent. And it's interesting because Time of Changes, Downward to the Earth, um, Book of Skulls, they all have first-person narratives. In Book of Skulls, there's four different first-person narratives. There's very little of that in this. This is third-person omniscient, reflecting the theme of, you know, was God an astronaut? Is God out there in the stars? Is, is Krug God? Should the androids become gods themselves? Is man God? All those sort of big God-bothering questions are there. So, you know, it is that thing. So I would put this on a par, I would say, because it's not so up close and personal, it is a book which is more classical, as I say. Really, I would put this on a par with possibly The Man in the Maze, which I think is my number five. So I would say this is possibly number six, but I absolutely loved it. But it, it, it's certainly in my top six, and I'm really glad I went back to it. And I just think when I first read it, I was too young and too enthralled to Dick's way of storytelling. And I wasn't mature enough as a reader to appreciate this. And my appreciation of Silverberg came late. I read other things. I read Man in the Maze was the next one I read, and that was great. Um, and for, for some reason, I never reclaimed with Silverberg. I read Tower of Glass in 86, and I thought it was magnificent. But it took me quite a long time to sort of get through the rest. But I would urge you to not do that, is when you've read a load of PKD, read a load of these, because they're fantastic. So, so that was Tower of Glass. And I've talked for nearly half an hour, it's longer, so I do apologise for that, but I hope you've enjoyed it. I just want to talk about the other books, probably not for so long. So we are going to talk about Barry Marsberg soon, as I say. We're also going to talk about Bob Shaw and probably some more PKD as well, because I'm going to be dick courageous on the channel and people do like the PKD. Now, a writer who I find frustrating and occasionally very enjoyable is Ian Watson. Um, this is Alien Embassy. This is a book club edition from the early 70s. This came out. This is his, his third novel. And um, this was three quid and I couldn't resist it because I've got lunch, yeah, the other jack could be more, of course. And Ian's somebody who, do you know, I could have really sort of, <laughs> not fractious relationship with him, but an interesting one. And he always had lots of critical acclaim. J.G. Ballard said he was the, um, the best British novelist of ideas in science fiction. He said possibly the only British SF writer of ideas, which is a bit mean. Um, but Ian's always had lots of ideas. And I think his first story was published in New World 69, 70, Roof Garden Under Saturn, I think it was. And it's great short stories, actually. And I say this is his third novel, I believe. And I put his second novel, The Jonah Kit, which is referred to there, which again is about contacting extra extraterrestrials in a SETI type scheme, but with cetaceans using whales. And Jonah, of course, refers to Jonah and the whale. The Old Testament's religious stuff again there, um, if the stars were gods and all that. And this is Alien Embassy. And to begin with, I love this. And I'll tell you why in a moment, what I said to begin with. But um, Ian's work has, for me, he's always has so many ideas if you like ideas going off popping like a load of firecrackers you love him and it's a nice fleet sharp short book and he's got a very stringent tone he writes really well his writing's beautiful you know it is really really good and he's excellent with characters in the jonah kit there's these characters all the characters are vile they're all spiky and horrible i hated all of them but it was really really enlivening because you thought gosh these people you know they, they're vile you know they're all t terrible in their own way but you just loved it because they were such fully rounded human beings they were real people they leapt off the page and the idea is astonishing you know so it wasn't a pleasant read but it was a great read my problem with Ian is that I've often found that there are too many ideas in one book and you know SF novels are the novels of ideas it's about ideas the idea is the hero and all that stuff but sometimes there's too much and 
you don't know whether he's sort of showing how clever he is or he can't restrain himself or the one thing leads to another leads to another this is conceptual breakthrough conceptual breakthrough which is great you know and there's a lot of strength in that and he is a writer who does set up to challenge you and he does challenge me which is great but i don't always like the results and maybe that's my failing rather than his the basic idea of this is a method has been found to contact um, beings on two alien planets who are quite different from human beings and um, that is acquired through sex through tantric sex through things like chakras what have you the characters are pretty much all non-western the central character is female and black and this is in the early 70s so all you people who think that identity pots is new in sf you know get the door now it's not it's not a new thing at all and the characters are very well very well drawn and it is it's it's that uncomfortable for me sort of measure where you know eastern mysticism and science come together and there used to be a book called there still is a book called the Tao of physics by fritz of capra which has been really, really big in the, in the in the 70s and 80s and you don't hear much about it now and it's sort of the parallels between eastern mysticism and physics and you know i think the general consensus came to well actually there aren't that many you know it was one of those things that was deemed to be the case it's not a book you hear much about now and really it's about people who are sort of they're raised and they're tutored to see whether they're going to have the right sort of tantric ability to be able to use this to project themselves into the world and this is what happens through sex they project themselves into these alien worlds to contact these aliens to learn about their planets their environments because actually going to the stars you know it's just not going to happen so that's how it begins but there's a sort of conceptual breakthrough earlier on where the sort of scales are lifted and something else happens. And I'm not going to tell you what it is in case you want to read it. I don't want to spoil it. And then it goes from one thing to another to another. And this is the issue I have with Ian. I often don't like where he takes me. And I say it's probably my failing, not his. So I got very frustrated and I've never met him. But sort of, I've had a couple of brief contacts. I wrote about his work in a reader's guide to sf for a book selling company back in the 90s and he sent a letter at, or an email i think it was a letter at the time to one of the other co-editors who he knew and said oh this must have been you and the editor said no it was steve you know <laughs> and um, he sort of pass it on so i got in touch with ian when i wrote 100 must read science fiction novels and i said do you mind if i use a quote from your letter which described me as something like you know a perceptive and perceptive genius or something like that because ian clearly liked what i wrote um, as part of the blurb for the book and he said yeah fine go ahead but we had another contact later on where i asked ian what were good markets for science fiction stories in, in italy and i think he thought that was a little bit cheeky but there you go but um, he's a really interesting guy um, so you know do give if you've not read him do give him a read i am going to revisit more of his work some of it i love it's always challenging and fascinating sometimes it's not my jam but if you like hard science and you like ideas going off and i think the critical thing with ian is that sometimes it is a bit much but you know what can you say he's a quester so he's a good guy so you know give, give him a try even though that one didn't do it for me what else have i read recently i did a quick reread of um dave hutchinson's europe at dawn because this came out back in about 2017 this was the sort of climax of the series and he's just done a new book cold water which i haven't read yet it's been out for a couple of months now i'm waiting till i'm in the mood and it takes this same basic idea but goes off on a tangent i find it really hard to talk about these as i just want you to read them so if you haven't read europe in autumn which is the first one you know it's a fantastic merging of spy fiction tropes with sf i think one review said that dave's work was rather like christopher priest meet, meeting um, john le carre i'd say more like len dayton but there you go and you know it's great stuff i don't want to talk about it too much and i, I do and i don't because i i don't want to give the game away i want you to discover yourself because dave hutchinson to me is one of the few people still reading so i reread that i must say it had less impact on me even the second time than the first three books in the series did and i'm not a big serious guy but i'm looking forward to cold water and i hope to interview dave on the channel at some point and um because i did an event with him back when this came out which is great great stuff so self-effacing funny guy great so i enjoyed that what else well another reread again from my early days this is abc three short novels by samuel r delaney this is a vintage usa trade paperback there's about six of these i decided to get all of these a few years ago because the difficulty of getting delaney's books in hardcover in good nick 
both the price of them and the condition you know he's just insanely collectible i've got one or two um but you know it was just outside my price range you've got to find them first in the states it's not so bad in the uk it's really tough and you know it's worked really expensive so what is this this three short novels it's his first novel the jewels of aptor which he wrote when he was about 17 18 then there's the ballad of beta 2 which um i have a hail hard cover of which i've read and also they fly a chiron which was an early novel that was rejected by donald a wilheim and there's great forward and afterward in here about these books and about the writing of them and delaney writes these really really well they're fantastic and i see this is absolutely beautiful so jewels of Abdor was the first delaney i picked up and I had a sphere paperback with a red livery. And I have to say, I, I didn't enjoy it at the time. And it was, Delaney had this huge critical reputation. And I didn't think a lot of it. And I got rid of it. Um, and I think the next Delaney I read then was Nova. And that was it. You know, that was that was the thing. Nova, the Einstein intersection, aka a fab fabulous, formless darkness. Um, the award-winning stories, the short stories, things like, you know. Time considers the helix of semi-precious stones, the star pit, I and Gamora, one of the finest short stories I've ever read of any kind. So um, I picked these up and I thought, well, I'll go back, I'll go back to this. And it's really interesting because it's described on the back, uh, Jules Vaptor, as a science fantasy story. And it does have a certain similarity to it's got a quest narrative. It's got a character, a big guy called Urson, which of course means bear. And he's rather like Fafard from, you know, the um, the Fritz Libra sword series. And there's a little guy called Geo who's like a poet. And he claims he's a magician. He's not really, he's just a poet. And he's rather like the Grey Mouser. And there's another character called Immo, who's um, a man of colour. And it's, it's, you know, classic sort of Delaney tropes. You can see things which are going to come up in the future. Um, the beginning of it they're going to go on this sea voyage on this quest and that reminded me of the tides of lust um aka equinox which was the delaney book which, which was banned and i'll tell you about that again because i know criminal in his channel has read hog recently and i know all about the background with delaney and, you, and you've got to see it in context and you know delaney has this thing in stars stars in my pocket like grains of sand there's a super big character and there's a tiny little sort of flash of eroticism in this but generally it's a straightforward narrative the writing is more straightforward and i think that was my problem even though delaney can be difficult to read for some people i've always loved his work um sometimes you you are thinking well what was he trying to get to here and that's part of the interest but stylistically i always thought he's fantastic but this is his weakest book stylistically after and i say he's very very young and he, he says about how he sold it to um donald a wilheim at ace and of course donald a wilheim door door was later on wilheim worked for ace for years and years and years and so that as an insight his work is great and as I say, they say it's a science and fantasy narrative, but it's not. It's a science fiction narrative. It's post-apocalyptic. It's post-nuclear. It's the future. There's these quests for these jewels of Aptor, which are secretly not jewels. They're something else. And the sort of background, the clash between two places, Aptor and Leptor, becomes clear. And a lot of the imagery is couched in magical terms. But it's very much SF. I must say on a reread, I enjoyed it more. It was interesting looking at it in the wider con sort of context of Delaney's work and all the Delaney I've read since then, most of which I read in the 80s. And it's still, though, I didn't find it that exciting. You know, as a first book and for a reader who is used to the quest narrative, who likes the quest narrative, it's probably one of the best things. And it does have flashes of poetry and it's wise and it's funny in parts. But it really didn't grab me in the same way. I'm going to reread um, The Ballad of Beta 2 as well because that's a good one. That's about a generation starship being studied or the, the work which has come out of a generation starship or the lack of aesthetic works being studied by a student in the future. And it shows Delaney sort of being drawn towards academia. And of course, he spent years in academia after the fact. And they fly a chair and I've never read. And that was his rejected book. And the story of how it was rejected and why it's really interesting here. So he teach you a lot about writing. So that's really good. So those are Jewels of Aptor, which I don't think I'll ever read it again. But it has reawakened the need in me to read some Delaney there's the, the Delaney I haven't read is the latest stuff, but I want to reread some of the classic works again because I just love them so much. They're so good. Something I mentioned in the Hay video was this book, Zona, by Jeff Dyer, 
on Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker. And of course, Stalker is the Russian science fiction film based on Roadside Picnic by the Stugatsky brothers, now famous. When this film came out in the late 70s and it was first shown on TV in the 80s, um, you know, we'd sort of heard about it, those of us who were keen. Solaris had been talked about as the Russian 2001 that appeared on TV. We were all excited. And then this came along <clears throat> and the book um, was far, far less famous than the Strugatskys are more famous now than they've ever been. And it's great because there's so much of their work in print. There's more coming this year, a couple of months time. There's some more stuff coming. The later books in the se the sequence, which begins the sequence about Maxim Camera, uh, which begins with was now called The Inhabited Island. When I read it, it was called Prisoners of Power. Um, two of those books coming out, which is really good news. Um, yeah, I've read this before when it first came out about 10, 12 years ago. And Jeff Dyer writes all sorts of things, novels, essays, what have you, all sorts of subjects. Very funny, uh, very good writer. And really, it's about, you know, Stork being his favourite film. The big issue I had with this book, both on the first read and the reread, is that I don't think Dyer understands SF. I don't think he wants to understand SF. I think he thinks that most of it is junk. The Sturgeon's Law there, which is fair enough. But so much so that I don't think he's ever read the novel. He mentions the Strugatsky brothers a couple of times. Um, and for a writer writing about a film based on a book and a good writer, a perceptive writer, you would think that that'd be a thing. But no, this is that kind of thing. That, as I said, you know, SF's no good. They bellow till we're deaf. And if it's good, then it's not SF. So it is of interest if you like Stalker. I would give it a read. Dyer is a good writer. I do have that bias against him. So give it a try. I enjoyed it a second time, but it's going to be handed on to a friend of mine. I'm not going to read it again. Right. Something more recent. I guess is all of those to 20th century. This is 20th century as well. Is Richard Cadry's Kamikaze Lemur. Um, of course, Kamikaze, we know what that was. The Japanese guys who got in their planes and flew them into um, Russian ships, you know, in um, World War II. So um, sort of military suicide. Kamikaze Lemur. So Japanese and French mess together. So um, um, suicide love, the love of death, what have you. Very Yukio Mishima. And um, it says a novel of the future. Very, very handsome, as you can see, it's in Martin's Press. This is from about 95, 96. Kadri was best known at this point for his first novel, Metrophage, which came out as 87. It's got on Yellow Jack in the UK. It was an ace paperback original, I think, in the States. And I've got it upstairs. And it was a cyberpunk novel. And I think John Clute in the Science Fiction Encyclopedia said it was like sort of a permanently bored. If it's not John, do forgive me. It's whoever was writing that entry. It was like a bored social researcher with his finger pressed on the fast forward button and it's okay metrophage and I've read other things by Kadri and he's very very good on the surface but not so much beneath it and I'll tell you a little bit about it it's about it's set in um, early 2000 about a rock star who has just he sort of tried to commit suicide immediately after a New Year's Eve concert. He's done the big 31st of December 1999 thing. His band's really famous. And he's come off stage and he's down a load of painkillers and vodka. And he drinks a lot of vodka, a lot of stollies, what he drinks. And, you know, he then gets sent off to a sort of rehabilitation centre. And his manager's trying to get the story out that he's dead, he's committed suicide. And all sorts of fake news spreads out about him, what have you. It's a first-person narrative. And K.P. writes really well. You know, his prose is beautiful. And it's very cyberpunk prose. But it's not too derivative of Gibson and Sterling and Shirley. You know, it, it glitters, but it's got lots of clean sort of lines in it. There's lots of great vocabulary, lots of great imagery. And basically... This central character, this rock star, this singer, he um, suffers from, or rather enjoys, synesthesia. He sees sounds, he hears colours and so on, and always has done, which has helped him in his music. And he sort of escapes into the demimonde of Los Angeles, falls in with this um, young woman who wants to make music, and he's using synths and samplers and what have you, and doing sort of real-time recording of things like Howler Monkeys and what have you. And he's going to create this new form of quasi-ambient music. And he's looking for the perfect synesthetic hit. And there's more to it than that, but that's the basis of it. In the background, Los Angeles, San Francisco, the whole sort of California, um, it's mostly San Fran, I think there's bits of LA, um, has all become swathed in jungle. The jungle has grown from the south from Latin America way up into California and the southern United States and it's never explained why and people have mentioned ballads so it's rather like the drum world where it's sort of gone up there 
and gangs will have taken over. There's a lot of drugs, there's a lot of drinking, there's a bit of violence. There's a filmmaker who's who does dreadful things like setting fire to horses to film them to get hold of the footage he wants. So, you know, you inevitably start to think, is he going to mention Heart of Darkness, Apocalypse Now, Life During Wartime, you know, Downward to the Earth, all those things. Well, <laughs> no, you know, I'm not. There's a little bit of that, but he doesn't go too heavily into that. And um, the problem with this book, as I say, is that really... It's got a great surface, but surface isn't enough. And, you know, the character is seeking a kind of apotheosis, redemption, all that stuff. But it isn't really, it's not really emotive. It's not really sort of dark or mysterious or misty and descending fog into the soul in the way that, say, Lucius Shepard's jungle-based books are. And it really didn't do it for me. I mean, KV writes really well and it had good reviews, but... It's not a major book by any means, so this will probably go on the Sal pile. But he had a big success about 10 years ago with the Sandman Slim books, which I would describe as this sort of gothic sort of horror things with punk elements. They're a bit like, you know, Iggy Pop goes to hell. And they're good fun. I've read one of those, and he's done probably about 10 of them. And the sort of thing that you'd like if you like The Crow or Hellboy, that sort of stuff. But it didn't really cut it for me. So nice writing. But... I didn't really think there was a lot underneath the surfaces personally. So that's Richard Cadry, Kamikaze Lamour. I would probably stick with Metrophage. I don't think I'll be reading any more by Cadry. So we'll see. Um, but you know, he's got his virtues. I just want to finish briefly. Um, I recently read Purgatory Mount, Bad Roberts, which I'll be talking about in a lot more depth when I interview Adam in a few weeks time. Looking forward to that. We're going to focus on um, his more recent books that I've read because he's got a huge oeuvre and um, you know he's he's very kindly agreed to an interview so I'm looking forward to that so we'll talk about that and this is a book which has some similarities to Tower of Glass and we'll talk about that nearer the time it's got an interesting opening and closing sequence which form a frame narrative and then the main body of the narrative is quite different it's got a Tower of Babel type thing going on um, but it's really really fantastic this has been out in paperback for a while and um, for some reason I didn't get round to this and um, I do love Adam's work and it's fantastic so you can pick it up but as I say Adam and I will talk about that before too long um, also um, just before I interviewed Chris Beckett, I read Beneath the World of Sea, which I've covered in the Chris Beckett interview. A beautiful book, out in paperback, of course. Now, this is one I sort of missed out as well. I had sitting around for a few years. Great stuff to get that as well. A final word on Tower of Glass. I re-watched Blade Runner 2049 recently, um, and I decided to watch this, and I never work this way, but I was talking about James Salas in one of the New Wave videos on the channel recently, and James Salas, as I say, became a very successful noir writer, and he wrote Drive, which was made into a film with Ryan Gosling, great film by Nicholas Winding Refn, which looks more like an SF film than most SF films. And um, I decided to watch this and I thought, oh, hang on, and Ryan's in it. I also decided to watch it because I'd started to read Tower of Glass. And when I first saw this film, I thought of Tower of Glass straight away because there is that horrible character who's taken over the ashes of the Tyrell Corporation, played by Jared Leto, who's a sort of messianic creator of the androids. And, and he treats them far, far worse than um, Krug does in Tower of Glass. You know, he's, he's more than indifferent to them. He's actively cruel. And there's that one horrible sequence of the female android. And there's a part in the way he reminded me of Krug, where he says, we should own the stars. And straight away, I thought, I wonder whether Hampton Fanshawe, who wrote this, really ever read Tower of Glass. And there's lots of similarities to Tower of Glass in lots of ways. So if you read Tower of Glass, watch this again and have a think about it, because you'll see what I mean. And my big issue with this is it looks fantastic it's way too long it sounds fantastic the music's great but it adds nothing to dick's vision maybe it draws something from silverberg who can say and that i think is down to the fact that it's purely written by hampton fancher now when fancher wrote um his screenplay for blade runner of course other people got involved from the studio because they didn't like it and fancher has gone on record and said he doesn't like to android street electric sheep he doesn't think philip k dick was that good a writer and you know he comes on with this sort of naive all the sort of naive humanist simplistic stuff in Blade Runner and in this, the sort of draws the narrative down to sort of pat emotions and what have you. I put down for Fancher and I think Dick was more complex than that. And I think Dick would have hated this personally. I really don't think he would have liked it apart from the visuals. So there you go. So that's a roundup, a much longer review session than I planned. I hope you enjoyed it. 
I hope it'll sort of get you out there to read, particularly Tower of Glass. And maybe I'll do another one of these in a month's time. Bye for now.